So, Eva, you recently co-wrote a book about Gestalt therapy and Buddhist psychology. Yes, and thank you for um, this invitation to talk about that and to talk about those ideas um, that I've been very passionately interested in for a long time. So it's exciting to be here and talking with you about that. Um, so this book was published in July uh, with my co-author, who's also my husband, partner, Stephen Zahm. And it is an integration of Buddhist psychology and Gestalt therapy. Um, it lays out um, the convergences of the two systems and also looks at how they're different and um, has a lot of uh, information about the, uh, the clinical application of these concepts. So mm -hmm. really, I feel like in some ways, it's the first uh, thing that I've seen in this field that's kind of a full integration of a psychotherapy system that's really compatible with Buddhist psychology and mindfulness um, and bringing these two together. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're talking about an integration, we're talking about similarities and differences. So do you want to elaborate a little bit on what might be similar and what might be different between both and how sure. they lend themselves to integration? Sure. So in the book, we have two chapters um, that are describing convergences. And the first is the convergences of views and the second is convergences of methods. So with the convergences of views, we look at how Buddhist psychology, under, Buddhist psychology understandings and Gestalt therapy understandings. So for example, uh, view of human nature, how we see humans, how we see um, our human experience. And the similarity there is that both Buddhist psychology and Gestalt therapy see us as uh, with potential for growth and transformation, mm -hmm. see us as whole and complete as we are, and that the ways that we run into suffering or difficulties have to do with not something that's innate in us, but have to do with what Buddhists, the Buddhists would call obscurations, or in Gestalt therapy, we would call modifications to contact, contact boundary processes that obscure our potential or interfere or interrupt our potential for our natural growth and regulation. So yeah. in that way, both systems have, Gestalt therapy is based in a theory of health rather than pathology. And we see Buddhist psychology that way too, the understanding that we have this potential for um, joy and compassion and growth and transformation. So Gestalt therapy and Buddhist psychology both have that perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one. Exactly. Starting, from the, starting from the potential and dealing with the obstacles that hamper the potential. Yeah, exactly. But not seeing those obstacles as sort of innate to who we are, um, mm -hmm. but more as things that have been added from our, based on our experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's one view of human nature. Um, another is um, how we understand uh, how change happens, um, that um, we, uh, th this goes, actually this goes more into the, um, into the convergence of methods, but um, in just going along with what I've been talking about, part of the way that change happens is as we stay with what is and increase awareness. So, those things that I was saying about where the obscurations are or where the obstacles are, the way that both systems address those is very similar. Like what happens in mindfulness meditation and what we do in Gestalt therapy is we pay attention to our present experience, our embodied experience, um, and we increase awareness. And with awareness, and both systems I think converge here too, see that the process of growth and transformation is organic. Yeah. that it comes yeah. as a result of that increased awareness. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, there was something else I wanted to say about, oh, um, view of self. You know, in, in Buddhist psychology, that always seems to be one of the most um, perplexing sometimes to people is that understanding of not self. 
And I think Gestalt therapy, um, Gestalt therapy and Buddhist psychology converge in certain ways there in that in Gestalt therapy, we understand self as process and that there really is no solid, reified, ongoing permanent self. So that really meshes very well with the Buddhist psychology understanding of not self. Of course, it doesn't mean that we don't have a sense of continuity over time, that we don't have aspects of who we are that we recognize and other people recognize, but that really that's not grounded in some solid, unchanging um, experience or way of being. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. seems like another, that's another important convergence. Um, so as you talk, the, the thing that um, I very much like about this is that as we talk about what is convergence, it also expands the uh, appeal to people who are not necessarily gestalt therapists, people who are not necessarily thinking of themselves as uh, influenced by Buddhist psychology, but that um, we're going away from the, the characteristics, the, the uh, established uh, camps, if you want, to uh, find a connection with people who recognize themselves in these traits that you, that you described. Yeah, I love uh, that. For instance, people who see self as a process. And so, uh, in a way, the, the conversation is more than just, strictly speaking, Gestalt therapy and Buddhist psychology, but noticing how a lot of traits that many people might have are represented in these and can be integrated uh, yeah, into I, an approach. Yeah, I really love that you're saying that because I think that part of what um, my interest has always been, and Fritz Perls talked about this, um, Fritz Perls, one of the founders of Gestalt Therapy, um, talked about this way back about um, that do we have to be so kind of divided into these different therapeutic camps or different ways of understanding things, and can we come at things from a more... Um, a more sort of empirical perspective of, well, what do we really observe? What really happens in our, in our experience, in our interactions? Um, what, uh, what works? You know, what's helpful to people and what's not? Um, so I really like that idea of, of just kind of a broader perspective of some of these concepts without so much even the label mm -hmm. of, um, oh, well, here's Buddhism, and here's Gestalt therapy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's a nice that's a nice perspective. Um, the other one, other couple things that I wanted to um, touch on because it's such an important aspect of Buddhist psychology is the understanding and of Gestalt therapy is the understanding of um, what creates suffering. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from a Buddhist psychology perspective, um, the there's a, an important difference between pain and suffering the inevitability of pain of living and the suffering that we kind of superimpose on top of that pain of living by our resistance, reluctance to be with what is, inability to be with, let's say something painful or be with grief, the ways that we avoid or uh, stay away from experience um, and that that's kind of this added layer of suffering. So in Buddhism, there's this um, slogan that, um, uh, pain is inevitable and suffering is optional. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's not really totally optional because we're so um, programmed, right, to do those things, to try yeah. to go toward what's um, going to be pleasurable and go away from what's painful. And so I think what Gestalt therapy brings there, Gestalt therapy has a very similar view of what causes um, uh, our, our distress, what causes our symptoms, what causes our um, difficulties, and that is our difficulty being with what is. So if I'm angry and I don't want to be angry, then part of what I'm doing there is creating added suffering for myself. I'm maybe rejecting the part of me that's angry. Maybe I'm turning that anger back against myself and getting depressed. Um, so what we do in Gestalt therapy is we help people, first of all, become aware of and notice that kind of process. And also um, in that process, as we're able to be more with what is, um, we uh, may be in pain, 
maybe the pain of the anger, or maybe we go deeper into the sadness or the hurt or the powerlessness that's underneath the anger. But then we're with our actual full authentic experience rather than having an argument with ourselves about whether it's okay yeah. to feel what we feel yeah. or not. So yeah. in both mindfulness meditation and in Gestalt therapy, um, we're seeing here's how suffering gets created and here's the cure of suffering, which has to do with the, the being with what is, the attending to experience, embodied experience. Um, we have an example in the book of someone who's dealing with grief. And she comes into therapy um, wanting to, to get over or be over her grieving. Her mother died know, some number of months ago. And so the, the, that's an example of this where if this person were able to be fully with her grieving, she'd be in pain, but instead she's suffering with this idea of who she should be, that she should be strong, that she shouldn't be sad, that she should be back to normal and not feeling what she's feeling. And so that's the suffering. In Buddhism, um, the, one of the ways that the Buddha talked about this pain and suffering was first arrow and second arrow. Mm -hmm. And um, talking to his disciples about, um, you know, if you were shot with an arrow, of course that would be painful. And then if you're shot with a second arrow, that is going to increase the pain, right. right? So, so one of the ways that we look at this pain and suffering is that that second arrow is what we shoot at ourselves. So in this right. case, with this client, she's being critical of herself. She's feeling bad about herself that she didn't bounce back from her loss, that she sees herself as weak. So that's all the suffering and second arrow. Part of that. So, so the, the, the image that comes to mind is that of uh, layers on an onion. There is the uh, pain and then you have that extra layer that we add uh, exactly. in our processing it or, and, and removing that. Yeah, yeah. And the removal part of it is, I think, is a place that Gestalt therapy has so much to offer because I think some therapy systems... Um, particularly recently where there's been a lot of focus on acceptance. Mm -hmm. I see that sometimes being problematic because people can use it as another should and superimpose it on top of their experience, like I should accept. And so in Gestalt therapy, as we really take people right where they are, we work with that non-acceptance. So mm -hmm. in the case that I was just describing, the woman who doesn't want to be sad or doesn't want to cry, or doesn't want to show um, what she considers weakness, we work directly with that. We help her elaborate on those feelings, why it's important, understand what, what it was in her history that made it important for her not to have certain feelings. And so there's a way of just working directly with that and unfolding it and unraveling it and getting more awareness and insight into that process. Right, right. So the acceptance of what is includes the acceptance of the non-acceptance. Non-acceptance. We said that exact yeah. thing in the book, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so those are um, convergent, some of the convergences of views, and I think I've already attended to some of the convergences of um, method in terms of mindfulness mm -hmm. and thought therapy, where we pay attention to the present moment, in Gestalt therapy, just like we do in mindfulness, um, that we are, stay with what is, um, and that we're very interested in the actual, um, our direct sensory experience, our embodied experience, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. our, with um, mindfulness. Yeah, yeah. So um, as we're talking about this as an integration, um, what I'm curious about is, in a way, the experience of the person integrating you, um, you know, coming, being a psychologist, being a Buddhist practitioner, and have a sense of how this integration has happened um, over time, uh, how it happens uh, in, on a day-to-day -day basis when you work, but just kind of the inner experience of that integration. That's a great question. Um... The very first uh, meditation retreat that I ever went to, which was in the late 70s, um, I was a fairly new Gestalt therapist. 
So this is about 40 years ago. And um, I was sitting in the meditation retreat, listening to the teacher give instruction on mindfulness. And I was saying to myself, wait a minute, this is Gestalt therapy. That the instructions that she's giving are like, I know about this. I know about sitting with what is and paying attention and allowing awareness to increase and not trying to change what's happening, but just being with it. And so I was very struck by that and very taken, as I was with Gestalt therapy, very taken with that whole idea of change being organic and not imposed and um, how we could increase awareness. And, but I never at that time had any idea that this could really have anything to do with actual psychotherapy practice. They just mm -hmm. seemed very different to me, very separate. And I didn't pursue my meditation practice. I was, I think, what some people call a nightstand Buddhist for a long time, where I had all these books on my nightstand, and I would read a lot, but I wasn't really practicing or meditating. And then about 20 years ago, um, I got back connected with practice and started doing a lot more daily practice and meditation retreats and things like that. And as I did that, I was more and more taken with the, the intersection and these convergences. And in 2006, I gave a presentation at an international conference. There's an uh, organization called the Association for the Advancement of Gestalt Therapy. It's an international organization. And no one was really, again, even in the Gestalt therapy world, people weren't really talking so much about mindfulness or Buddhist psychology yet at that, at that point. Although I know in other, I now know that in other circles, you know, that already was um, developing. But I gave a presentation that was just on the convergences. And um, when I came home from that, I said to myself, well, you know, I think there could be a book in this. And so that was 12 years ago. And so this book that we've just published was a 12 year process of both thinking about these ideas, my own experience of meditation practice, and then how they came together within my own experience. Like when I'd be on a meditation retreat, what was coming up that was sort of what I would think of as the psychological issues that I was used to, how I was used to addressing them. And then what, what was the added perspective that I had from sort of the, the, mm -hmm. the Buddhist view of, let's say, of suffering or attachment and suffering? Um, so I started initially, um, and, uh, and at some point I kind of dragged my husband into writing this book with me, so we ended up writing it together. Um, but we also run a training program together for Gestalt therapists. And I said, you know, I think there'd be some value in um, bringing the mindfulness and the Buddhist psychology into the training program. Like I started to see the ways, and we have a, a chapter about this in the book, I started to see the ways that my own meditation practice was impacting my therapy without there being anything intentional about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I felt like I was more, um, well, more grounded, more clear, um, more able to attend to my own embodied experience in the sessions, uh, more attuned to the nuances of my patient's experience in the sessions. Yeah, yeah. More able well, to, go ahead. Well, just to, just to, to say that um, in a way you noticed in yourself that the person in the room was now uh, performing, acting, being different. Uh, and you say more grounded, more uh, aware of the nuances of your uh, self perception, your, your felt sense of yourself, and more aware uh, of the uh, nuances of, the, of, of what was happening with the client. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and more able to really slow down and stay more with the immediate experience. Um, in Gestalt therapy, we can do experiments, for example, that kind of have an arrow pointing into the future or the next thing, or mm -hmm. we can really stay 
very directly with the immediate experience that's happening. And I found myself doing more of that. So rather than, so let's like say someone's explaining a polarity where there's one part of them that wants this or feels this way and another part of them that feels another way. Rather than quickly moving into having people embody each of those sides or be in that polarity, I might say something like, just get a sense of what it feels like right now to be sitting right in the middle yeah. of those two poles. And, and then we would just stay there and then see what emerged out of that. Yeah, yeah. So, so kind of the slowing down of the process of just noticing that, ah, noticing the polarity is not an automatic jumping into exploring both sides, but is a point that's worth being experienced in itself. Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfectly said. And, and you know why I'm, I'm I'm stopping a little bit at these, uh, you know, just because in as you're describing your experience of saying, here's how my mindful self, you know, is is seeping into the therapy hour, um, is to say, okay, so maybe some people who are not necessarily thinking of themselves as having a mindfulness practice, but through a training in experiential methods, have noticed that they themselves. Uh, are more aware of a felt sense experience, are more slowing down, are more aware of being in a process that they explore in that way, uh, mm -hmm. to kind of create a bridge to say that that experience is similar to the experience of somebody who finds themselves influenced by meditation practice uh, into what happens in therapy. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, because we had been training therapists in Gestalt therapy for a number of years, and we were always working with helping people slow down, helping our students, our trainees to be more embodied in their sessions, to pay attention to experience, I started to think we could really, I think our trainees and our training program could really benefit from integrating this these ideas, both the Buddhist psychology ideas and the meditation practices in the actual training program. Mm. So I think it was around 2008 or so that we started doing that. So our training program now is um, Buddhist psychology and Gestalt therapy. And then what we do in the training is we meditate together. We talk about the Buddhist psychology ideas. We do different meditations. Um, sometimes we'll do an exercise where we'll go directly from a meditation and then have people work with each other in the sessions so that they can get a sense of bringing that kind of um, clarity or presence or just the paying attention to the mm -hmm. nuances of experience into their session. So mm -hmm. that's been a big part. So in terms of my development here, um, before I really started intentionally bringing something different to my work with patients. Um, I was already being influenced by my meditation practice and um, doing something different in terms of the training and seeing you know, what we could bring to the, to the training program. Um, and so really it was a, a lot of years after that that I started to be more I guess intentional about mm -hmm. how uh, some of the Buddhist view might inform what I was doing in therapy and uh, considering starting to look at uh, where people were. I mean, it's, it's a bit contradictory because in Gestalt therapy, we were always very interested in the difference between a person's direct experience and their concepts about it or their mm -hmm. ideas about it, or their thoughts about it. You know, we're always um, interested and curious to bring things more into direct experience. But I think what started to be added for me was to see that that difference, the difference between direct kind of primary experience and thoughts and concepts and ideas was also at times maybe always, I'm not sure, the difference between the first arrow and the second arrow, the difference between pain and suffering. And that as I started to have that perspective and helped people move more into their immediate experience, I started to notice, really notice that difference, notice how um, people could be, and, and with being with the pain more directly, that that was where the 
movement and change and growth and transformation could happen. And that was also where a different kind of contact was possible. Yeah. So, so what, what I'm hearing is that, um, um, you know, you, you, you started with that perspective already as a Gestalt therapist mm -hmm. to differentiate between the uh, felt experience, the primary experience, and, and the constructs that we put around them. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in, in contact with Buddhist psychology or in that context, uh, starting to see that that frame that we put around it is actually a constructed reality that uh, in a way creates a layer of suffering. Right, right. Yeah, so, the, so that whole, I, I really like what you just said and that whole idea of, um, of the constructed reality. That's, so that's where now in our, in our um, uh, the penultimate chapter of the book where we start talking about Buddhist psychology informed Gestalt therapy, which is what we're calling this this integration. Mm -hmm. That's an important piece of it. What you just mentioned, the um, the understanding, the the seeing through constructions in in a more radical way. Um, you know that not only can we see through let's say an introject or you know something that's a, a should that's superimposed but now we can kind of see through that whole um, identity construction and the ways that the suffering is in that so the thing that gestalt therapy doesn't um, doesn't include but we're trying to include it now is the understanding of um, Buddhist psychology, the Dharma seals, the understanding of um, not self, the understanding of um, what we, how, of dukkha, of how we actually, um, this, that suffering is, is inherent in the conditions, in our conditioned existence. Um, so the, the idea that um, we can be freer of that level of suffering. So, oh, I know what I wanted to go back to, actually. Am I going too fast? Uh, no, I'm not sure I fully. So let's just strand that maybe we'll come back to. Okay. Uh, because you, obviously there's something you, you connected with, and then I'd like to come back to this strand. Yeah, okay. So, because I, I think I need to backtrack to just yeah. to clarify this. So. Um, one of the differences, so we had talked a lot about the similarities and the convergences, but you had also asked me about the differences mm -hmm. and what we need to bridge to bring these together. So I got a little ahead of myself in going into that, that bridging versus looking at where the differences are. So um, in uh, Buddhist psychology, there's the understanding of the relative level of our experience and the universal level of our experience and the universal level has to do with these givens of existence like the given that we're interconnected the given of of the truth of not self um, the truth of suffering um, and in gestalt therapy that's not it's it's not um it can be we you know we we, we draw some parallels mm -hmm. but um like for example that in gestalt therapy we see self as process and in buddhist psychology um, there's an understanding that there's not a reified self but we don't make a distinction in gestalt therapy between sort of this um, um, primary this this material relative level of our existence and this more universal view mm -hmm. so um in terms of bringing them together, they do have different, um, um, like a different focus, a different purpose, and a different ultimate aim. Mm -hmm. in, in Gestalt therapy, our ultimate aim is for people to um, develop more awareness, understand themselves better, and have greater capacity for living an enriched life, for um, aliveness and contact and um, a fresh vitality in their existence that's not so 
um, contained or uh, constrained by old patterns, um, ways of um, conceptualizing about experience. So, but we're looking very much at that relative level. We're looking at individual and relational psychological issues, right? Yeah. The person's history, where they're, uh, uh, you know, what was, um, what created wounds, what requires healing. It's very relational. Um, and Buddhist psychology, again, it's, you know, it's like this wider um, perspective where regardless of your individual psychological issues, you're going to suffer as a human being. In right, so we put the things in the context of the human condition as right. opposed to just looking at individual problems, yeah. Yes, yes. So the universal givens of, you know, the birth, old age, sickness, and death, and mm. that, uh, you know, um, I think, I forget it, it's, I think it might be Charlotte Joko Beck, one of the Zen teachers, I think, says, you know, life can be an endless series of disappointments. And so no matter what, how well you do, no matter how much gestalt therapy you do and how much you work through your psychological issues or whatever, you're still confronted with birth, old age, sickness, and death, right? So one of the things that I got interested in and one of the reasons that I wanted to bring this together is because it seemed to me that um, even though, and, and a lot of the, um, the Buddhist teachers say that this is a limitation of Western psychotherapy, is that if you're not dealing with this uh, understanding of ultimate suffering, you're only, you're only helping a person part of the way. Mm -hmm. That it's not, that it's not a complete, um, there's not complete healing or there's not complete transformation if we don't have that perspective. Ultimately, right, right. and so so from that perspective, that uh, it's it's that um, we are living in an environment, um, and if we don't have a sense of our relationship to our environment, uh, we only have a limited view. Right, right, and the realities, those realities of existence, you know, mm -hmm. that ultimately everything is impermanent. Um, that all the things that we try to hold on to and that we think we can hold on to are ultimately slipping through our fingers and the reality of the the pain of that and the potential suffering of that especially if we try to hold on to things that we really can't hold on to so you know in the early and i think aging has been a, a factor in this too because it seems to me that it's easier to grab this perspective as you get older, yeah. you know, when I was younger, it was easy to say, oh, life is going to be great when I get to here, when I get my degree, when I start my practice, when I move into this other house, or, you know, there's always the next thing and where life is going to be, everything's going to fall into place. And as you get older, you realize, well, you know, yeah, that might fall into place and something else might fall out of place. Um, so it's a really I think useful and important perspective to have. And I started to want to have a way to work with people um, to recognize some of that because also sometimes people can be um, really self-critical about, um, I don't know, you know, not being happy or not getting their life completely figured out so that it's perfect. And mm -hmm. so these Buddhist teachings are like, well, it's never going to be, Never get right, it's a welcome to the club, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And rather than that continued striving mm -hmm. to, you know, keep uh, trying to make that happen, could we take a step back and look at that process itself? So that's where I started to um, uh, start to bring in some of these things a little bit more directly in my work with people. And then I started to find, because it's so much in the, in the um, culture now, that people who were doing meditation practice, we could start to um, use that in some way to support the therapy. Mm -hmm. I started to introduce things like um, loving kindness practice or compassion practice to people um, to, for them to uh, work with their own experience of something with themselves. There's an example in the book of someone who is dealing with um, her 
teenager who um, was taking drugs and stealing and ended up getting kicked out of the house and was homeless. And um, she really wanted to, she really needed to set limits and boundaries with him around that. And it was very painful for her. And at the same time, she wanted to kind of maintain an open heart toward him. So she started working with doing meta practice, loving kindness practice, in which she was wishing him well and compassion practice for herself in the situation that she was in. So using some of those things, which I hadn't really done directly before. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. so it's interesting because in a way, uh, in a traditional uh, medical oriented uh, uh, paradigm, we could say this is the equivalent of doing a little bit of physical therapy, a little bit of exercise, take aspirin, whatever. But what you're talking about is actually also practicing a different way of being. Uh, and saying therapy alone is not going to give you that practice. And uh, you, as you do that, then it helps you change. Right, right. I think, I, I think that I want to underline what you just said. Therapy alone is not going to give you that. I think that was so important for me to recognize as I started on this, this Buddhist path and the meditation practice that I'd done, you know, probably at least 20 years of psychotherapy in various contexts, in individual therapy, in training groups, in, you know, all kinds of, and the meditation practice offered something really additional mm -hmm. and, um, and, and important um, that um, I think, no, again, you know, it sort of goes along with that idea, no, no matter how much of our personal work we do, if we don't have this broader perspective or, or just practice the continuity of, um, you know, like on retreat of taking the mindfulness from sitting on the cushion and staying with that in walking to the dining room and eating our lunch and, you know, that whole experience of really being present and, mm -hmm. um, connected mm -hmm. with experience one of the things that we say in the book is we think that you know gestalt therapy kind of always took it for granted that people would be gestalt therapy patients they would learn about awareness they would learn how good it felt to connect with present embodied experience and then somehow they would just be able to you know take mm -hmm. that out into the world and do that and to some extent that's true but the idea of being able to practice that between sessions, of really paying attention, um, it, it so much um, supports the work, and then the work supports being able to do that. Yeah, yeah, but so, so there's a, it's also like a, a realistic view that, um, you know, the idea, the wishful thinking is that once people get a taste of how wonderful it is to be mindful, you know, through therapy, then they would do it by themselves. And uh, the experience of real life is how difficult it is, how we are, uh, there's a lot of things that prevent us from doing that. And it takes that intentionality to actually bring it into real life in a yeah. sustained way. Yeah, I think that's why like with our training program, it's really useful for the, for the trainees, for the therapist to see that they, you know, in the, in the training weekend will meditate and people will say, I don't know why I don't do this all the time. It's so great when I do it, but then they'll see how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. So if they're working with their own patients on mindfulness and meditation and wanting to support that, they also have the experience of, oh yeah, this is, um, one of the teachers says um, it's um, simple, but not easy. Right. Okay. And, and so, so maybe in, in a way you could extend it to something that's more than mindfulness practice and say that the work we do with our clients, you know, the insight is relatively easy, but turning that insight into sustained change uh, is actually something that's much more difficult. And uh, having a constant reminder of how difficult it is to translate that sense of knowing 
into uh, being transformed, into applying it in our life and changing our relationship with the environment when the environment gives so much pressure to maintain the status quo uh, is really not something that's that easy. Mm -hmm. Right. But I also think that, um, that both in both systems, I think there are, two, there are kind of two things operating there in, in what, at least what I'm hearing you talk about. Um, I think there is a kind of change that is based in experience and awareness that does organically shift something in us, inside of us, and in our capacity to be with ourselves and to uh, relate to other people. And that there's um, the, an added challenge of actually shifting something that we uh, do want to do, um, but that also sometimes there's some, um, what's the word, you know, reluctance. Like, mm -hmm. like you know, I often ask people, well, what happens when you sit down and breathe? And, uh, well, I think of all the things I should be doing instead. Or mm -hmm. um, I don't really want to be with what I'm feeling. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then that can bring up more places to work with, um, you know, where that reluctance is or where that difficulty is in therapy. Right, right, right. So you're making a distinction between two kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. um, there's some change where we have an insight, we have a glimpse of what's possible. Uh, there is, um, uh, and that in itself, uh, you know, is provo provokes a shift, and so we're different, right? It's uh, and, and we act different. Mm -hmm. And there's also another kind of change where we have a really strong sense of, well, I would like to do this, I would like to do more of this, but at the same time, this uh, desire for change is counterbalanced by some kind of a resistance, some kind of something else, some, some fear. Uh, and um, what you're saying is in that situation, it's great to embrace the fear because it opens the door to what might actually bring in progress. Right. And it's a way that, the, um, that if someone is doing a meditation practice and in therapy at the same time that the two become synergistic because people can come in with what is coming up in their meditation practice and then that can get worked with in therapy mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've lost track of where I was with answering your questions. Um, so I, I have a sense that actually in some way we have addressed it. Okay. Um, uh, you know, maybe not in a linear way, mm -hmm. but it feels like we have addressed it. Okay. And, and actually what I want to just check is, um, um, you know, that it feels like that last part that we did about change uh, was in a way putting the whole context of therapy in a broader context mm -hmm. um, of uh, change, about mindfulness, about, uh, um, you know, and how the, uh, in a way, uh, awareness can be helped in therapy. So it felt like a very nice place of integrating both. And I want to check if you want to say a little bit more about that as a way of ending, or if there's something else you might want to add to, uh, to this conversation. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm still with, I'm kind of struck by this idea of um, how our own uh, personal growth and that sort of relative level work um, can interweave with um, a Buddhist practice, meditation practices, whether it's mindfulness practice or um, loving kindness or compassion practices, that um, they can both support each other. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, we were just talking about this in our training group with someone who's in our training who was a Buddhist monk and talked about the issue of spiritual bypassing and how sometimes when people go to directly to spiritual practice but haven't done personal work that things can get kind of papered over and you know there's the idea that we're going to transcend our um, personal issues or feelings or not be angry or um, you know not be um, critical or whatever and that um, 
the uh, so as people do that meditation practice, as those things come up, rather than thinking of them as, oh, well, that's not very spiritual, or you're being a bad Buddhist, or you're a bad meditator, or whatever. Um, again, this Gestalt therapy perspective helps us um, come to, well, of course, that comes up, because you're human, and um, you can work with that, and you can embrace that, you know, this whole idea, you know, I mean, people in meditation practice, I think a lot of times in mindfulness, it's like, sure, I'll be mindful, but I only want to be mindful of this, or, you know, here's what I want the experience to be like. And so it becomes this more, more radical uh, understanding, I think, of including everything, you know, that nothing's left out. And so, so what feels very striking when you were saying that, some, you said, but of course, you know, that comes up and that gesture and that tone of voice uh, seemed to me to embody mm -hmm. that part about acceptance right. of what is, including of the resistance, including of the difficulty. Yeah, yeah. 